And good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm catching you right at the uh, dip in the circadian rhythm uh, with a topic that may not exactly grab you, so try to stay awake. Um, I'll do the best I can to do that. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the, Bar the, the Blood for Spasm Society for having me come here, and I'd like to thank Mark in particular for inviting me to speak. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the oral pharmacologic agents uh, that are used to treat uh, blood spasm and focal dystonia. We'll see if I can get this right. Side, click it down. Okay. There are many different ways uh, one can treat blood spasm. Uh, when I first started as a movement disorder specialist, there really weren't uh, very many ways, techniques, approaches to the treatment of blood for spasm or focal dystonia for that matter. Believe it or not, I started before botulinum toxin, so at that point there wasn't botulinum toxin. But now we have all sorts of different types of methods to try to treat this often functionally disabling disorder. I'm going to deal with oral medications, and in fact, this is what I do have the longest experience with, given that when I started, this was about all that we really had uh, to apply to, uh, to blood for spasm. Uh, this is going to be a short presentation, uh, not because I'm short, but because there isn't a lot of evidence uh, to support oral medications for focal dystonia or for blood for spasm. In fact, there's no FDA-approved oral medications for the treatment of blepharospasm, and there are no adequate clinical trials that have demonstrated safety and efficacy of any pharmacologic, oral pharmacologic agent for blepharospasm. So for the most part, treatments are based largely on anecdotal report, case series, retrospective studies, uh, and clinical experience although you never want to underestimate clinical experience. Now, these are some of the oral medications that have been used uh, for blepharospasm. Uh, I'm going to start with levodopa. Levodopa, of course, uh, as Cinemet, which is the combination of carbidopa and levodopa, is a drug that's used to treat Parkinson's disease. Uh, it is a dopaminergic drug. You've heard dopamine already mentioned several times this morning. Um, blepharospasm is not... Parkinson's disease. But there has been suggestions of some dopaminergic influences involved, at least in a subgroup of patients. In particular, patients with this uh, disorder called dopa-responsive dystonia can do very well with low doses of levodopa. However, blepharospasm is seldom, if ever, I reviewed the literature, the only manifestation, adult onset blepharospasm, the uh, primary manifestation of dopa responsive dystonia. Having said that, in some patients we may give a trial, uh, depending again on what their inclination is toward medication. Anticholinergics are the next group of drugs listed here. Uh, right now there's really only uh, three available in the United States. Um, two have uh, been taken off the market, one hopefully to return. Anticholinergics in high doses are very helpful for children with generalized dystonia. That means dystonia involving many different body areas. And the reason that they're helpful, I believe, is because one can get to high doses in children. In adults, especially in adults in their 50s and 60s, when you start getting to high doses of anticholinergics such as Artane, there are side effects and they can be significant to the point of memory deficits. Reversible, but yet present. Uh, so you may forget that you have blepharospasm, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't think that's a good way to treat blepharospasm. Uh, baclofen leorosol is another drug that's used uh, as a, one of the primary agents in children with childhood onset generalized dystonia, again, because they can tolerate high doses. Adults, I've been underwhelmed by the uh, efficacy of baclofen or leorosol as a treatment uh, for blepharospasm. I also have down here clonazepam or clonopin. Uh, sometimes that drug can be helpful because it is an anxiolytic. And in some patients who find that stress uh, exacerbates their symptoms, uh, low doses of clonazepam may be helpful. However, sedation, depression, and dependence are uh, things to be kept in mind as side effects. 
Now, we don't have, as I said, any uh, really good large clinical trials of any of these agents in uh, blepharospasm or focal dystonia. So usually what I refer to is this large retrospective series that was done by Paul Green uh, and reported many years ago, I think it was 1988, uh, where he just relates the experience at Columbia using a variety of different agents. And he found that levodopa, about 10% benefited. Now, keep in mind, this was before dopa responsive dystonia was really well understood. So they may be amongst this 10%. With anticholinergic agents, about 30 to 40% of people benefited. Baclofen, about 20%. Clonazepam, about 15%. So you can see from this retrospective study that oral medications offer uh, limited benefits in a small number of patients. Um, again, no oral drugs to this point on this list have been uh, FDA approved uh, for the use uh, in blepharospasm or in focal dystonia. There's a lot of other drugs that have been tried. One promising drug, perhaps, is tetrabenazine. This has been looked at retrospectively and will be looked at prospectively. It's a drug that's now approved in the United States for the treatment of hunting, for the Korea and Huntington's disease. It is not approved for dystonia, and it does have significant side effects, including depression, which one should always be aware of as they start the drug. Uh, not only that, but getting insurance approval for this very, very expensive drug in the United States uh, is, is challenging, to say the least. Uh, tizanidine, gabapentin, mexilatine, and many more drugs have been reported anecdotally or in, uh, again, case series as being of some benefit. Dopamine antagonists, such as haloperidol, um, thorazine, uh, eripiprazole, abilify, have been reported to be of some benefit, uh, again, retrospectively. We do not use these drugs, however, because of the potential consequence of irreversible movement disorders that can result from chronic use of these agents. So one doesn't want to give a patient more than they started out with uh, by, their, by your treatment. Now, before botulinum toxin, uh, this is pretty much what patients felt like. You know, oh, my God, here comes another pill because we would use them alone and or in combination, hoping to find the best combination or single drug in order to treat patients. Uh, we were not all that successful, again, mostly because side effects would intervene, particularly in adults. Uh, so why are there no oral drugs approved for blepharospasm? Well, I think one of the basic problems is we don't really understand the underlying uh, pathophysiology and pharmacology of blepharospasm or other focal dystonias. In addition, blepharospasm is a relatively rare disease. So when one wants to do a large clinical trial, identifying patients to participate in that trial can be somewhat of a challenge. And it does require clinical trials to establish evidence of safety and efficacy. There's just no question about it. Double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials, um, you can't, you can't second-guess the results of those. And finally, there is somewhat of a reluctance on the part of some patients who are being treated with something that works for them, such as botulinum toxin, to forego injections in order to participate in a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and that's an understandable uh, reluctance. This just shows what we are challenged with as clinicians uh, insofar as gathering enough evidence in order to provide oral pharmacologic treatment uh, for focal dystonia. And what I have listed here, this is from the American Academy of Neurology, but it gives the different types of evidence uh, that one can produce. Class one, of course, as one would imagine, is the superior kind. That's what you want. Those are our large, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies uh, with a defined outcome in a representative population. Class two, they're smaller. They can be matched groups, uh, not as representative. Class three um, really end up being things like case series uh, and, and the like. Class four, again, um, 
that's expert opinion to, to, to some degree. So you can see what we'd like to do is have these class one, this class one kind of evidence, because in order to be recommended for clinical use, um, being class eight, requires at least two consistent class one studies. So again, the challenge is there. It isn't that easy to develop new treatments for any disorder. Um, it's expensive, and it does require a lot of patient participation. However, that doesn't obviate the need for these kinds of studies. Uh, Dr. Hallett brought up a study that's being conducted at the NIH. Um, there will be other studies that will be presented. Without your participation, um, we will get absolutely nowhere in developing new treatments, oral or otherwise. Now, some of us kind of mock this concept of, well, why do you need evidence-based studies? And I think certainly in certain instances, for example, this instance, parachute use to prevent death and major trauma, uh, systematic review of randomized controlled studies. Well, of course, there were no randomized controlled studies of whether parachutes are safe and effective for skydivers. There is no equipoise in this question. In blepharospasm and in the treatment of focal dystonia, there are a lot of questions, and there is true equipoise, meaning we don't know necessarily uh, whether a drug is going to work or not work. Clinical trials are important because it takes you on the road to FDA approval for any given agent, which allows all sorts of, uh, makes it easier for insurance reimbursement, makes you understand more the safety and the efficacy behind any given treatment. And it goes through these phases of study uh, prior to uh, FDA approval. So in summary, in the words of Mark Hallett, who wrote this in a chapter, and I thought it just really quite summed it up, Prior to the introduction of botulinum toxin injections, the treatment of blepharospasm was problematic. Totally agree with that statement. Anticholinergic drugs were generally considered first choice, but the experience of many clinicians is that chronic administration improves symptoms in less than 20 to 25 percent, often with intolerable side effects. And I would include most drugs in this category. Tetrabenazine has shown some promise in retrospective studies, other drugs in uncontrolled studies. Uh, there may be a good response in up to 50%, but this response does tend to be transient. So I think as you can tell from my rather uh, brief overview of the pharmacologic agents to, to used to treat blepharospasm that uh, this is Denali um, or Mount McKinley in Alaska. I had the, the great fortune to be able not to climb it, wish I could, uh, but to at least see it, uh, showing that we are kind of, insofar as oral pharmacology, we're still at base camp. We haven't really made a climb to the summit yet, and I think with other forms of therapy, we're, we're much more on our way.